today. And now for the good news. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In my line of work, I seem to spend a lot of time in the doom and gloom end of the spectrum. This is not my natural disposition, despite what you might think. It's simply based on the facts as they emerge. So when good news arrives, we celebrate it, though of course with our natural degree of scepticism. Today we have the June 2018 employment data from the ABS. The headline is a fall to a five-year low. The trend unemployment rate was 5.4% last month according to the latest figures. The trend participation rate remained steady at 65.6% in June after the May figure was revised up. So this continues a gradual decrease in the trend unemployment rate from late 2014 and it's the lowest rate since January 2013. Trend employment increased by around 27,000 people in June, and the growth was evenly split between full-time and part-time employment, with both increasing by over 13,000 people. The net increase of 27,000 people comprised well over 300,000 people entering employment, and the same leaving employment in the month. Over the past year, trend employment increased by 318,000 people, or 2.6%, which is above the average year-on-year growth over the past 20 years at 2%. And 15 to 19-year-olds have contributed around a third of trend employment growth since January 2018. Employment for 15 to 19-year-olds increased by over 6,000 in June and grew by around 58,000 over the last year. The trend monthly hours worked increased by 3.4 million hours, or 0.2% in June, and by 2.6% over the past year. And year-on-year -year growth in trend employment was above the 20-year average in all states and territories except for Victoria and Western Australia. Over the past year, the states and territories with the strongest annual growth in trend employment were New South Wales at 3.7%, the ACT at 2.9% and Queensland at 2.6%. But let's not get carried away. Underemployment, those in work who would like more work, still sits at around 9% and is trending a little higher. This is significantly higher than in 2011, when the employment rate was in a similar region, suggesting that more people feel the need for additional work today. And of course, the stats are based on a wide definition of employed, as even a small number of working hours a week shows as an employed person. Alternative measures of unemployment report much higher rates, so there is a question as to the significance and reliability of the ABS numbers. But the trend remains down, which is good news. But in the region above 5%, that's the level at which the RBA says income growth may start to rise. So we're certainly not there yet. Next, a note from the CBA today went through some of the recent data releases. The mood amongst consumers, they say, has improved over the past three months. They cite the Westpac Melbourne Institute Index of Consumer Sentiment, which rose by 3.9% in July to its highest level since November 2013. They say the index is now well above its long-term average. Consumer expectations around the economic outlook have improved despite dwelling prices deflating. This suggests, they say, that fears around a negative wealth effect may be overdone. And it also implies that households, as a collective, probably recognise that a small easing in dwelling prices isn't such bad news after such strong growth in the prior years. Indeed, the sentiment survey showed a sharp lift in the proportion of Sydney respondents possibly first-time buyers, who saw now as a good time to buy. There was also a lessening in job security fears, and fears around unemployment have fallen 7.5% over the year. The lifting consumer sentiment has closed the gap between business and consumer confidence, and over time, divergences between consumer and business confidence tend to be ironed out, and the results converge. 
The recent coming together has been a result of a lift in consumer sentiment against a pullback in business confidence from a high level. Growth in wages remains weak in Australia, they say. The Q1 wage price index, it's the most recent, rose by just 0.5% and the annual rate is steady at 2.1%. There is still a lot of spare capacity in the labour market, which is suppressing wages growth. But the news is not all bad. There are a few tentative signs that wages growth may be about to lift a little. First, the wage price index, including bonuses, rose strongly in the first quarter 2018 and the annual rate picked up to 2.6%. So they say it's possible that there is just more noise in the data and the wage price index including bonuses will converge with the standard wage price index excluding bonuses next quarter. But it is also possible, they say, that firms are indeed lifting the pay packets of workers by a bit more than 2.1%. Instead of doing it via bigger rises in base pay, however, they prefer to do it with greater use of discretionary payments like bonuses. Second, the RBA reports that there are now more firms expecting a pickup in wages growth and fewer firms expecting a decline compared with recent years. Indeed, RBA Governor Lowe appears more assured that wages growth will lift. In June, he noted that there are reports that some employers are finding it more difficult to hire workers with the necessary skills. That comment in his July statement was bolstered to there are increasing reports of skills shortages in some areas. Despite the fall in dwelling prices, consumer spending growth has picked up over the second quarter 2018, while sentiment has hit its highest level in almost five years. So there is no evidence yet of a negative wealth effect in play. They say we suspect the reasons for this are twofold. First, context is key. Sydney dwelling prices rose by around 75% between 2012 and mid-2017, and Melbourne dwelling prices rose by around 60% over that period. So with that perspective, the current deflation has so far been quite mild. Secondly, the Australian stock market, as measured by the S&P ASX 200 index, has risen by 7% over the past three months to a multi-year high. So from a wealth perspective, many households have had the equities component of their balance sheet strengthened. Indeed, movements in equity prices are far more transparent and obvious to householders than changes in the notional value of their property. And I'll add a postscript there, but of course those are all book values, so relatively meaningless. Looking further ahead, CBA says that dwelling prices will continue to deflate over the next one and a half years or so. Credit standards may be further tightened, supply will continue to lift, mortgage rates are more likely to go up than down, and buyer price expectations have adjusted downwards from exuberance to more rational levels. But they do not expect a hard landing. Population growth, driven by net immigration, they say is expected to remain strong, and rental growth is still positive, which ensures yield looks reasonable in the low interest rate world. We also expect the unemployment rate to gradually drift lower, which means that the risk of default is low. A further softening in dwelling prices would probably have no material negative impact on consumption, they say, as has currently been the case. But there is a risk, they say, of course, that a harder correction in prices, a fall of, say, 10 to 15%, could weigh on consumer spending via a negative wealth effect. CBA says that this is a risk, but it is not their central scenario. For many households, the number one headwind that they face with respect to consumption is debt repayment. Australia has one of the most indebted household sectors globally. Debt-to-income ratios have risen from around 148% in the mid-2012 period to a record high of 190% in 2018. This measure includes all households, regardless of whether they actually have a mortgage. So for households that have a mortgage, that figure is significantly higher. It has increased steadily as interest rates have come down, despite lower rates making it easier to repay debt. Basically, growth in the net flow of credit i.e. new credit less repayments, has been higher 
than growth in income. But they say a high debt burden relative to income acts as a constraint on future household consumption growth. It means that interest payments as a share of income are higher than otherwise. And of course, the principal must be paid too. This leaves households with less income that can be spent on goods and services. And it means that households have a much greater sensitivity to interest rate changes. From a demographic perspective, they say it is younger households feeling the debt burden more acutely. But there is also about $120 billion of interest-only loans in aggregate that are scheduled to roll over to principal and interest loans annually over the next three years. Borrowers shifting to principal interest loans will face higher monthly loan repayments. And this is where the good news runs out, because the latest S&P ratings spin index to May 2018, based on their portfolio of mortgage-backed securities, showed a further move up in defaults compared with last month from 1.36% to 1.38%. In fact, Western Australia's default rate improved a little, as did Victoria's, but there were rises in New South Wales of 0.02%, Queensland of 0.04%, and the Northern Territory up 0.52%. ACT has the lowest default rate at 0.75%, followed by New South Wales at 1.05%, while the Northern Territory and Western Australia have the highest rates of 30-day-plus defaults, at 2.84% and 2.67% respectively. Looking across the period in default, the most significant rise across prime loans was in the 61 to 90 day bracket, up from 0.22% in April to 0.25% in May. 90 day plus arrears remained the same at 0.67%. Significantly, the larger hikes were seen in the major banks' portfolios with the prime spin rising from 1.36% last month to 1.38% in May. And there was a rise in 61 to 90 day past due loans from 0.22% last time to 0.25%. Now, whilst these moves are small, arrears are now as high as they were back in 2011. But remember that interest rates are much lower today. So this highlights the risks in the system. And this does not appear to be a seasonal issue. It is more structural. We'll continue to report and analyse the data as it comes in, and rest assured, good news will get its airing on the channel. But, net-net, the debt burden, which we've discussed before, will remain a break on optimism for some time to come. And remember, debts have to be repaid, eventually. As always, if you like what you've seen here today, please share and like the post, and add a comment or question. I read them all. And if you want to join the growing band of subscribers who receive alerts when we release new posts, do subscribe now by hitting that subscribe bell. And if you've already subscribed, many thanks. I really appreciate your support and participation. And if you value the content we produce, please do consider joining our Patreon program, where you can support our ability to continue to make great content. I'm Martin North, the Principal Analyst at Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.